So it is wonderful to see a combination of um, people who have already contributed lovely ideas to this um, conversation on dangerous speech and prevention of violence and hatred online. And equally lovely to see some of you who, as far as I know, have not yet taken part in this conversation. Um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the, to the um, frame of this, um, of this workshop. I use the term workshop on purpose. It's not a panel discussion. We really want very much to have a conversation with as many of you as possible. Um, uh, so at, I introduce very briefly then Angelo Kune from iHub Research in Nairobi will uh, present some rather remarkable new and path-breaking uh, work. And Derek Roots from uh, Gill in Montreal uh, will talk a bit about some work that his lab, he, he and his colleagues uh, at his lab have already done, and also about some work that he and I are uh, planning to do over the next few years, next couple of years, and perhaps beyond that. Um, so first of all, we, uh, uh, I'd like to make a, a bit of a, of a contrarian and provocative suggestion, and that is that um, uh, those of us interested in the online world, um, particularly but not only in the United States, um, have divided sort of into, into two groups, those who are uh, principally interested in freedom of expression, and those who are worried about some of the ugliest expression online. Um, and there's sort of an unexamined assumption that you can't do both at the same time. That you have to be either a rabid, free speech zealot like me, or uh, somebody terribly worried about hateful, misogynist, um, homophobic, uh, vicious speech online um, like me. But then it's very difficult to pursue both of those goals at the same time. Um, this workshop is, is about um, doing both at the same time, um, about um, uh, something that almost hasn't been tried yet, which is to use um, science and, and um, experiments and investigation in online data to try to learn how, in fact, to do both of those things. That is to say, to diminish the expression and the impact of hateful and inflammatory speech um, online, while at the same time vigorously protecting freedom of expression. So that means we would have to find alternatives to what are so far pretty much the only three tools in a rather empty box. Um, so traditionally, authorities, usually government authorities, sometimes also religious and other authorities, have used, I think, only two methods to proceed against any kind of objectionable speech. The first one involves going after the speaker with some form of punishment. You know, you can prosecute a speaker, um, you can uh, uh, punish a speaker physically by torturing the person, for example. You can also kill an inflammatory uh, or hateful speaker. That's not such an old-fashioned or outdated method. The United States, for example, killed Anwar al-Awlaki with a drone in Yemen um, not long ago, um, in part because of his uh, uh, rapidly proliferating and apparently influential online speech. The second, uh, what I would call traditional method, is to go after the speech instead, um, trying to repress it, uh, trying to censor it, trying to delete it, block it, um, get rid of the content. Neither of those two methods has worked very reliably at any time, um, but online they are even less likely to, to succeed um, at uh, diminishing the speech and or its impact. Maybe the third tool in that, in that box has been the most common response of, of, for want of a better word, the online community, and that is don't feed the trolls. You know, when you see some awful uh, expression online, don't feed the trolls. Um, we don't really have any data on how that, on how successful that is either. Um, it includes some faulty assumptions like uh, trolls are one homogenous species, which um, we already have a little bit of, of early data to show uh, is incorrect. So are there other options? Um, one possibility is to remember that human communication includes three 
three necessary elements. A speaker, some speech, some form of expression, it can be an image, of course. Um, but then there's a third piece, and that is the audience. So could one instead um, think about an audience and work, work with the audience in order to make the impact of, of even inflammatory or offensive speech less? That's just one possibility. Um, there are some other uh, uh, num number of other intriguing possibilities that we'll uh, try to describe for you on this panel, and then of course we're very keen to, to listen um, to you as you describe all of the ideas that we haven't uh, thought of yet. Um, with that, I, I will ask Angela to describe to you some, uh, some work that has been done uh, principally in Kenya over the last two years um, in explicit effort to prevent violence that seems to have been in part catalyzed by certain kinds of inflammatory speech, including speech um, in the Kenyan online space. Good afternoon. Wow. <laughs> so good of an afternoon, I guess. Good afternoon. Yay! Good afternoon. Okay, I can see the lunch coma is really set in, so um, I will try and keep it brief, but I do have some slides here uh, just so that hopefully it will continue to engage you. Um, I, as Susan mentioned, I am based and come from the iHub Nairobi, just to show hands. Have any of you heard of iHub? <laughs> Yay! Even better afternoon. Um, so, so we are an open co-working space located in Nairobi, um, built for the tech community uh, to really use as they want. Uh, and my job is really to help to support the tech community and those in the bigger tech ecosystem, and I do that with iHub Research. So this is the research arm of the iHub, and uh, we do all sorts of cool stuff, but today, Oh, my mic is starting to die. Today, I'm going to talk about one project in particular uh, called Umati. Uh, Umati is Swahili for crowd. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll give you that one. Uh, and and it's, I just did want to introduce... I'm really loud, actually. I'm really loud. Oh, I'm very excited. It's okay to be excited. Okay. Everyone okay with this volume? Better? Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, so I did just include some background on where I'm coming from because I want to emphasize that uh, we came at the Bumati project not from a policing body or, or legal uh, body. We really are civil society. And uh, you'll, you'll see in a few slides why we decided to, to undertake the Bumati project in Kenya. So for those of you who may not be f as familiar with the Kenyan context, at the end of 2007, um, there was a hurried swearing in of Mai Kibaki. Uh, which resulted in fairly widespread violence across the country. And uh, violence during the elections in Kenya are actually not new uh, and have happened um, during uh, all of the elections. But what was shocking about 2007 and 2008 was the speed and, and the scope and severity of the violence, which actually uh, resulted in over a thousand people being killed uh, and, and over 600,000 people being displaced. Um, <clears throat> so this was in 2007-2008, and uh, at that time, uh, actually, Kenyan Human Rights Commission documented that hate speech that was being spread both offline by politicians um, during campaigns in, in rural communities, and also uh, the role of mobile phones during that period actually did contribute to the spread of, of speech that helped to condone violence and, and promote hate. Um, and this was in, in 2007. So five years later, in 2013, during the next general elections, uh, the tech community was, was thinking about this and the role that the mobile phone and also internet um, may, may have in, in contributing to, to the conversations and the things happening during the elections. Um, just to give you some more context, in 2007, there were 8 million mobile phone subscribers in Kenya. In 2013, over 30 million. So these kinds of, of facts and figures got us thinking that we should probably be paying attention to, to the types of conversations happening online. Um, <clears throat> anecdotally, we had heard that online forums 
uh, and blogs were also playing a part in the 2007 um, post-election violence in terms of aggregating groups of people. We heard rumors that people were, were offering to fund uh, pangas, machetes um, on the ground. These were the diaspora and Kenyans. But we really didn't have any documented um, uh, system to understand, was this a one-off incident? Was this kind of conversation happening on a widespread level? And this is what ended up birthing the Umati project. So Umati started really to, to better understand the conversations happening in the online Kenyan space. And in particular, we ended up looking at dangerous speech. And uh, it was through serendipity that we were able to connect with Susan, um, who really, you know, we built on, on the framework and guidelines that she has been able to create looking at uh, uh, factors that influence how inflammatory speech can be, and in particular, looking at the potential that speech can have in catalyzing uh, or inspiring collective violence. So, um, I don't know. It. Sorry? If the mic works, I can. Yeah. Um, so the idea, really two, two reasons for defining this category of dangerous speech. Um, the first is that, uh, looking at lots of examples of speech that has preceded outbreaks of collective violence, made it clear that there are certain striking patterns. It's uncanny. There are certain particular rhetorical patterns that leap out of case after case after case across historical periods and across um, uh, countries and continents. Um, so if one could develop a, a reasonably reliable way of identifying such speech, then um, that would be useful, especially if one could find ways of diminishing its impact without um, impinging on freedom of expression. The second thing is that dangerous speech is, thank goodness, a much smaller category than hate speech. Hate speech is such a widely used term, but there is no consensus as to what it means. It's defined variously in different bodies of law and certainly variously defined in common parlance. So, so, um, we're hoping that by focusing on dangerous speech, we can precisely pursue those two goals of protecting freedom of expression by not paying so much attention to this big inchoate category of hate speech, and at the same time, indeed focusing on the much smaller category that does seem to have this special danger, dangerous um, power. Are you going to uh, share this on these slides? Oh, I always write it all down. Oh, no, you don't have to write it down. Okay. Come find me and I'll give you a right, slide back. Happy to share any of this stuff with anyone who's interested, especially if you'll critique it. And it's on dangerousspeech.org, is that right? Or voices uh, Voicesthatpoison.org. So we were able to then take certain elements of Susan's framework from this, uh, and in particular, we, we especially looked at the speaker, um, the speech act itself, uh, and, and try to also gauge the influence of the speaker on the audience. And this was used for us to then code um, the speech that we captured uh, online, which I'll get into. Uh, <clears throat> so, so the projects actually started, again, for those of you who don't know, the Kenyan elections occurred last year, um, March 2013, so actually almost exactly a year ago. Um, and, and we were able to developed this methodology um, which helped us to then capture over 7,000 incidences of hate speech online, uh, dangerous speech. And, and so in order to do that, we actually ended up having to use human monitors. We hired 11 folks, which covered seven different languages, um, including English, Kiswahili, um, which is the national language, um, as well as Shang, which is a pidgin uh, language used widely in Nairobi by youth, uh, as well as five other vernacular mother tongue languages. <clears throat> um, we we looked, and, and these monitors were very hardworking. They came into the office and were constantly online um, from about 8 in the morning to 5 p.m., uh, checking out over 65 different blogs and forums, 240 Facebook groups, pages, and users, and over 310 Twitter users, as well as the comments section on all of the major Kenyan online newspapers. Um, <clears throat> and, and we have reports out. Actually, I would encourage you to go check those out. Um, there is 
there's a lot uh, that we've been able to put out, so I won't go into too much detail on sort of how we set up the project and, and some of the bigger findings. Please do check it out, I'll put the link at the end. But just to share so that we can kind of use this as a launch pad for our discussion today, um, two of the big things that we did notice, um, I mentioned that we monitored seven different languages. This was because we actually thought that there would be more kind of uh, conversations happening between um, ethnic groups in their mother tongue. But what we found instead was that most of the, the speech collected, the dangerous speech collected, was in widely understood languages. Um, so if you see here, English, and this is Kenyan English, um, but English nonetheless, and Swahili, together with Sheng, really um, were the majority of all of the, the conversations um, that we captured. Also noting, these are on public spaces, yes? So we weren't you know, hacking into people's accounts, for sure. We were not in private conversations. Um, so, so this could likely be due to the demographics of those Kenyans who are online. Uh, these still are a higher socioeconomic class, for sure. Um, also, it could perhaps be due to their desire to communicate with a wider audience. Um, but, but we're not sure, also, if you know, we, we really need to dig a bit deeper into even this finding. And uh, uh, some, some conversations with, with scholars have also suggested that maybe we should start looking for switching of languages, even within, it's, I think it's called code switching, um, within uh, one conversation. So use of different languages, um, which could mistakenly look like a pidgin, uh, Sheng, but actually may be um, deeper than that. So there's ongoing uh, work that we would also still like to do around this. Um, the second thing I wanted to just share was the source of where most of these comments came from. Uh, you can see here, almost 90% um, were off of Facebook. And uh, in comparison, Twitter had less than 1%. And so, <clears throat> this Right, there's a number of factors, likely, uh, to explain this. Again, mo more Kenyans are on Facebook, for sure, and it's also a wider demographic of users. Um, Twitter, it's hard to find specific numbers, but our estimates seem to suggest there's about 250,000 Kenyans who are on Twitter. Um, but these folks are very strong and vocal. Uh, for those of you who who do follow Kenyans on Twitter, hash KOT, um, you know, they've been able to even get folks presidents to apologize, they've been able to get CNN to apologize, they are a very vocal bunch. Um, and, and, uh, and they were the number one trending topic worldwide during the first presidential debate preceding this election. So just to give you some sense, it's, you know, we expected a pretty big disproportion between Facebook and Twitter for all kinds of reasons, including public and private, different expectations of privacy, and so on. But the, this disproportion is, is outside. So we also looked at, I mean, one of the reasons that we also believe that Twitter versus Facebook had such a large discrepancy was also just in the sheer architecture of the two platforms. Um, many of you in this room are probably more uh, techie than I am and can, can go into even more depth around this, but definitely um, the lifespan of the conversations was very different. On Twitter, things peak very quickly, and then the conversation kind of moves on to the next topic. Um, whereas on Facebook, it was much easier for citizens to congregate and discuss and pick the conversation back up. And especially um, in a country where you know people don't have the uh, connectivity, um, you know, 24/7, the way I think most people here do. Uh, people aren't always in real time. So people maybe are at a Wi-Fi hotspot somewhere at work, they can check in um, to Facebook, but then they go home and maybe they don't have um, access to internet. So then the next day, uh, they can then go back and the conversation persists over a much longer period of time. Um, <clears throat> so, so just then, I don't know if, is it okay to even ask for questions at this point? Because I'm gonna start shifting a little bit. Does anyone have like burning questions? Yes? So the corpus that you collected was from the period of the election. I'll just speak back. So yep. the corpus you collected from the period of the election, how does it compare to the background corpus of my election? So actually, um, so just maybe repeating the question if, if people couldn't hear it, how does does the sample of speech collected around the uh, during the elections compare with the baseline non-electoral period? Yeah. Yes. 
So we started the project six months before the elections, and you can see from October to March. Definitely, you know, a steady increase up until March and April. There was even a higher peak um, because there was some uh, discussion over the outcome of the election. So it wasn't until actually, I think it was late April, that the final results came out. And so during that month of April, in fact, was actually where it really peaked. Um, and we actually then were able to continue monitoring and actually and continue to monitor even till now. So we've been able to then see from May, you know, definitely the levels and the frequency overall went down significantly. Has the linguistic distribution shifted? No, not much. Um, but uh, we, so I would also encourage you to look into some of the reports because they can go more in depth around that. Good question. Yes. Yeah. I had a question about, you know, you showed us one of the <laughs> slides was about the number of Facebook users that were monitored, I think. The one, yeah. Right, so this one, 240 plus Facebook groups slash users as well as 310 plus Twitter users. How did you decide who to monitor? So the question was, how did we decide who to monitor? Yeah. And actually what the monitors did for the first two plus weeks, um, also while they were being trained and everything, was go through um, kind of the, the general Kenyan public spaces um, that many of them already frequented anyway, and kind of the big discussion uh, places, and, and use that then to determine and come up with kind of a source list, if you will, of all of the different people and groups, et cetera, that they then monitored. Um, I mean, it was a challenge, and this is something we also learned, especially finding things in vernacular language. Um, blogs and forums, it was a challenge to even get 10 written in some of the languages. And I think this is also because most of mother tongues are spoken, right? So they're not really languages they people type in, per se. Um, but the Twitter users and groups also were then continued, uh, continued to be added to that, to that list over the period of time. So um, as things trended, people continued to add. Does that answer your question? Just maybe one point of background on why there was such an interest in finding um, language in mother tongues, that is uh, what most Kenyans think of as their first language and the language of their own ethnic group or tribe. Um, that's because commonly Kenyans will say, if I hear something in English or Kiswahili, the two national languages, the linguas franca of the country, I hear it with my head. But if I hear it in my mother tongue, I hear it differently, I hear it with my heart. That I uh, heard that in in numerous interviews and field work about three years ago. Um, so it seems that, well, we can say we learned from this that in certain circumstances, even the language in which speech is expressed can influence its force or its, its capacity, its impact on, on uh, an audience. Person. And just one more, we also, as, as you recall, in the framework, looking at the speakers, so we also made sure to include all of the notable politicians, all of the, you know, what could be considered offline influential people, um, but, and this is one of our challenges, better understanding how that influence offline translates to online influence is still not completely clear. Maybe I'll take one more, just so that we can continue, and then we can ask more questions at the end. My name is Maria Maslany, I'm the founder of Yemen Rights Monitor. Uh, uh, on the first day of the conference, I gave a lightning talk on how, as a Yemeni woman, I was receiving what, many death threats, etc., and how they translated from, off, from online to offline, and how many women became silenced as a result because it was uh, targeting 100 female to 3 male, so a lot of the violence was also gendered online, and it translates to gendered violence offline. I noticed uh, the same trend about Facebook, that most of it was on Facebook, most of the harassment was on Facebook, though the people who harass me also have Twitter accounts. It still goes on Facebook even after they're blocked. And finally, my harassers address me in English, even if it's broken English, because as bullies, they wanted to have, go to the widest audience possible, whereas I am almost never harassed in Arabic. Thank you. Well, yes, we. I think a lot of the hate speech conversations in Kenya tend to be around ethnic hatred, 
Um, but what we found is that you know there's gender-based hatred, there's you know homosexual-based you know against homosexuals. There's a wide range, and I think that um, that is not necessarily captured um, enough, perhaps. And based on religion, and based on nationality. Definitely. Sorry, can I just yeah, yeah. one more? Um, so, out of the seven thousand plus incidents of hate speech, since we're talking about dangerous speech. Do you know how many of those you would categorize as dangerous speech? And maybe also, Susan, if you could give a couple of historical examples of dangerous speech so that people have a better understanding of exactly what it is as opposed to hate speech. So I didn't include in this slide deck kind of more of the breakdown just because I didn't want us to start getting it into No, I mean, we could go on and on. I could have a whole discussion around this. Um, but definitely, the, we, okay, we bucketed into three different um, sort of categories, if you will, based on um, the framework described. So offensive speech, nearly offensive speech, um, moderately dangerous, and extremely dangerous. And over the period of time that we monitored, definitely um, extremely dangerous was not always the majority, it was never the majority of the speech captured. Most of the time it was largely offensive speech. Um, as we neared the election period, you could see that the extremely dangerous and the moderately dangerous increased. Um, and then after the election period, offensive speech then is what really was, was the majority of the conversations. I can show more of that breakdown in the reports, but yeah. Sorry, you have a second question? First, you said about a couple of like, historical examples of dangerous speech. So I mentioned that, that there are patterns that leap out when you look at, uh, at dangerous speech, at speech that precedes um, episodes of collective violence. This seems to be because, after all, uh, people don't suddenly decide in their dozens or hundreds to get up one morning and massacre their neighbors. There has to be a collective psychosocial process that prepares people to, um, to take part in or um, at least to condone collective violence. And there are some steps in that process that have been described by, for example, um, genocide scholars. Uh, which seem to map onto the language. So um, one of the most, uh, uh, have noticed um, what I call hallmarks of dangerous speech, of which there are a number, I'll just mention two. There's one that's very familiar, I'm sure, to all of you, that is dehumanization. You speak to your own group, describing another group of people as pests, as vermin, as some sort of despised animals. The most common terms are rats, and cockroaches. I'm sorry to say I know the words for rats and cockroaches in an astonishing variety of languages for that reason. Um, dehumanizing another group of people uh, makes the commission of, of killings or atrocities seem acceptable in a way that it wouldn't be if those people were still conceived of as um, what the genocide scholar Helen Fine calls within the universe of moral obligation of all of us. If the people are outside that, that, that um, boundary of moral obligation, if they are less than human, then it's different when, when um, uh, terrible things are to be done to them. Another uh, hallmark or characteristic of this, of this speech um, we now call accusation in a mirror because a Hutu, uh, guy who wrote a Hutu propaganda manual that was discovered after the 1994 genocide in Rwanda gave it this ingenious term. Accusation in a mirror is when an inflammatory speaker tells his, usually his, his or her audience um, that the other group is planning to come and annihilate them. So a very famous example of this is Hitler's speech in January of 1939 um, assuring the German people that the international Jewish conspiracy was planning to wipe out the German folk. Um, this was also a relentless feature of Hutu propaganda and it is found in, in, um, in many other <coughs> examples. Not to take up time, I, I, and, and also it's, believe me, it would be discouraging if I recounted so many examples too, but um, there are other hallmarks and there are innumerable examples. Perhaps uh, one other bit of explanation is that this, this um, analytical framework with which we are trying to distinguish dangerous speech from this much broader category of hate speech um, 
is based on the idea that you can make an educated guess about dangerousness, that is, capacity to inspire violence, uh, in context, by looking at five factors. The first three I've stolen from Aristotle, who already identified and described them beautifully in the rhetoric. Um, that is the speaker, the idea that some speakers have much more influence than others. The second, as Angela said, the speech act itself. The third one, the audience. Some audiences are already more receptive, more susceptible to incitement or to inflammatory speech than others. The fourth factor is the historical and social context in which the speech is made or disseminated. Depending on the context, of course, um, speech may be much more powerful. Um, and then finally, the means of dissemination, which could be the airwaves of a particular radio station on which a community is depending for most of its news, or as I mentioned before, the means of dissemination could also be a particular language. So thankfully, there was not, uh, in 2013, widespread violence after the elections in Kenya. There were um, kind of incidences of violence for sure, uh, most notably in Mombasa on the day of the, the voting itself. Um, but again, not to the scale of 2007, 2008. Uh, and, and there are many you know, theories around why that is. Some have said peace propaganda, some have said peace coma. You know, there was a lot of effort to try and make sure Kenya stayed peaceful this time around. Um, but a lot of people also said that the violence moved from the offline to the online. So there were even cartoons, unfortunately I didn't put it on any of the slides, um, showing the online space as being particularly violent. And so it actually was a topic of discussion um, in everyday conversation with most Kenyans that you know, the online space is really becoming very violent right now. Um, so much so that even mainstream media got involved. Um, so this is a, a picture I happened to just take um, at the right time. Uh, during the evening news on one of the mainstream um, news stations, I think this was NTV, or KTN, uh, and this was actually during the 9 o'clock news where they started doing name and shame. Um, so shame on you tribalists. And this is actually, you can't see it nicely here, but a tweet um, by, by an inflammatory poster, um, and I can't read for you here, but, but uh, they actually, dedicated at least 20 minutes um, during, during uh, the election period to say, look at these tweets going on online, shame on you, I can't believe you know this username, um, I can't believe you said that. And then over the, the consecutive days, you would actually start to see then the original poster um, apologizing. So I'm sorry, KTN, uh, I didn't mean for, for, you know, it was, put out in a, in, a, in a fit of rage, I don't know, you know, different apologies. Um, and we noticed this, not just uh, at that one-off incident, but throughout the data, as we started to go through the data for analysis, that on Twitter, and you remember now, Twitter had less than 1% of, of the dangerous speech we captured, we found that there was actually counter speech, or incidents where tweets that were not seen as acceptable to the general KOT, Kenyans on Twitter, um, would then get responded to. So rather than being ignored and left in isolation, they were actually then engaged. Um, people would say, help. So these, these screenshots, I'm sorry, are from Westgate attacks. So also shows that it's not just necessarily around the elections, um, but has continued. But you know, please, not now, um, and a retweet of the original poster. Um, so we've seen then the original poster then apologize, um, remove the tweet itself, or in some extreme cases, even take down their own account. Um, so, so this is something that I think uh, Susan will go into a bit more because this led to some ongoing um, and continuing interesting work looking into Twitter data. Uh, so just a few more slides um, and then I'll take it over to you, Derek. Uh, I think that this conversation and this, I should leave enough time so that we can start to discuss what are other ways then that we can perhaps um, broaden the audiences, inoculate the audience to promote this kind of self-correction. So uh, as Susan started out by saying, rather than punishing the speaker or, or censoring, you know, I think there are ways that we can start to then encourage good behavior and good self-correction. Um, <clears throat> so so you, can, this, you can't see, hopefully you just see the frequency here. Um, 
of comments. This is a screenshot I took off of Facebook recently from about a few weeks ago when a mainstream media uh, posted uh, a rather inflammatory framing of a conversation saying, um, let me see, are outsiders slowly taking over leadership at the coast? And you can see then on Facebook, people starting to respond back and saying, standard media, that amounts to, to hate speech, and of late you're becoming very petty. What's wrong in having a foreigner as a leader? Um, other people are saying, uh, shocked if the so-called immigrants, according to this uh, bigoted damsel, are actually Korean citizens. Um, and, and so then you can see, and that was all of these comments here, people then responding back and engaging again. So it's encouraging to see this, starting, this behavior starting to happen on Facebook. Um, so just briefly, and, and this is also in response to an earlier question, we are actually continuing to do this monitoring because we don't believe that just looking at just the elections themselves um, will give us enough information. Uh, we think the election cycle is, as a whole is important to continue to monitor. Um, that said, hiring 11 people, you can imagine, can get really expensive. So we are trying to now work um, to see how we can incorporate automation into the process and the methodology we developed um, in collaboration with other existing open source tools. So if any of you are working in this kind of um, areas, please do come and see me. Um, we are currently working on, on developing these tools uh, and we will then be testing them in other country contexts as well to, because this is not just a Kenyan problem, I think. Um, and, and we've actually been getting inquiries from other countries, South Sudan, Nigeria, uh, Burma, Myanmar, and so we are hoping that if we can lower the cost of running such an endeavor, that others um, in these countries can also start to better understand the online conversations. Um, and finally, just a, a shout out, I think Chris is also in the audience here, we are working together with the Sentinel Project in the Tana Delta of Kenya to also study the spread of this kind of information. Um, and to better understand the online-offline dynamics as well. Um, so with that, I'll just leave you with the link that I promised. Um, so please do check out more of the work that we have uh, online, and I think that then, back to you. Um, excellent. So uh, we'll do a couple of very uh, uh, quick presentations. I'm, I'm going to show you a bit more data from Twitter in context other than Kenya. And then Derek's going to describe uh, some existing work and, and what we hope will be some magnificent um, forthcoming work. And then, and then again, we'd like to engage with you. So um, perhaps you've concluded that, that in Kenya there was an unusual, or let me just suggest to you that in Kenya, an unusual climate developed before and during the election last March. That is to say there was quite a lot of counter speech or what some Kenyans began calling tongue-in-cheek peace propaganda, online and offline, by the way. I, I wrote a post a, a week or two before the election last March complaining tongue-in-cheek that you couldn't take a walk in Nairobi without seeing yet another billboard with various, um, you know, ecumenical leaders from different religions, you know, 30 feet high, uh, calling for peace, love, and unity. Or and there were the, uh, the NGO Spray for Change graffiti artists had sprayed peace murals all over town. Um, uh, school children were painting the word peace. Um, um, football, soccer uh, stars were on television calling on young men like themselves to remain peaceful because violence can mess up your day. Um, in one of the most hallucinatory examples, um, the GSU, the General Service <laughs> Unit, um, a police military force that was known during the dictatorship of Daniel Arap Moy for beating up students who were, um, among other things, demonstrating for elections. In this case, GSU troops um, um, looking very elegant in their full battle fatigues and their little uh, red berets were dancing um, um, in a quarry and singing a song about peace, love, and unity, and you know, we're all Kenyans and so forth. Uh, and that, that uh, became very popular um, just before the election. So there was a kind of onslaught of this counter speech of, of speech um, in which Kenyans call on one another to keep the peace, to remain calm, not to be violent, and so forth, um, to such an extent that um, 
uh, commentators like Patrick Gathara, a, 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 a terrific uh, political cartoonist and blogger, um, complained of, as Angela mentioned, the peace coma. So much peace propaganda, in his view, um, had led to a peace coma, and then he even went further and called it a peace lobotomy, which of course would be irreversible, unlike a coma. Uh, tongue-in-cheek and funny, but also it was a serious commentary suggesting that the overweening emphasis on not allowing violence to, um, to erupt again also was, in his view, um, suppressing dissent. People were so afraid, he said, we have been taught to fear ourselves, to fear our own capacity for violence, and therefore people are afraid to say provocative, uh, provocative things which should, it seems to me, worry us in the context of elections. I just offer that to give you a, a, a balanced and complex view of what was in many ways a kind of national experiment in Kenya. In Kenya there was a very strong consensus at all levels of society coming up to the 2013 election that something called hate speech had had a bad and catalytic uh, impact in 2007 and 2008. So, so in this sort of national laboratory, there are all kinds of experiments to, um, to counter inflammatory speech as a way of preventing violence um, with all sorts of results. Um, Angela showed a slide in which she mentioned inoculating the audience. That's a reference to the idea, as I said before, that instead of focusing on the speaker or the speech, one could try to pay attention to the audience. Um, this is something in, in, uh, an area in which some early experiments have been conducted, uh, mostly offline so far. For example, um, um, uh, I had the great fun and privilege of taking part in making four episodes of a super popular Kenyan television program called Vyaja Mahakamani, um, designed to teach people what inflammatory speech is, um, how it works, and in particular that it is a political tool used by lazy and disingenuous political leaders typically to aggregate power to themselves by turning their own groups against others. Um, that, those episodes were independently evaluated and seem to have had some good effect. So uh, I hope that that suggests uh, other ideas to you. Just quickly, I'd, I'd like to show you some examples of what seems to be effective counter speech in other uh, normative contexts on Twitter. Uh, what do we mean by effective is an important question. Um, one way of defining that is uh, counter speech that changes, if not the mind, at least the expression of the original inflammatory speaker. And maybe an even uh, more provocative and interesting way of defining effective would be um, counter speech that also influences the larger community of other people online who are watching um, the debate, who are watching the exchange, and so we're beginning to think of ways in which that also might be measured. On Twitter, it's, it's relatively easy to measure the capacity of counter speech to change um, the speech of an original inflammatory speaker, so here are some examples. Um, this is a, a, a Kenyan example. An original, very inflammatory tweet, uh, as a matter of fact, it just says continue. You, 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 th believe me, this is not censorship. Um, we just haven't got the entire original inflammatory tweet, but trust me, it was in the context um, um, very strong. After considerable counter speech, including avoid tribal hatred and you should apologize to the Kenyans on Twitter, that's exactly what the original account holder did. Sorry guys, what I said wasn't right and I take it back, lesson learned. Of course we're wondering what, what this person actually had in mind. No, a tweet doesn't necessarily tell us what, what someone was thinking. And eventually, if we can collect a number of examples like this, it might be interesting to think about um, contacting and surveying those people who either recanted or apologized. Um, if we scroll down, there should be some other examples below this hashtag, of all things, Miss America. Can you guys scroll down a bit? So the hashtag Miss America is because you may remember that when Nina Davaluri, an American whose parents immigrated from India, 
was selected as the latest Miss America. There was a tremendous surge of outrage um, on Twitter. For example, this top tweet, I am literally so mad right now, an uh, Arab won Miss America. Uh, um, all right, I'm going to permit myself to say this. We don't have any scientific evidence yet, but there informally um, seems to be a correlation between bad grammar and inflammatory speech. <laughs> Um, so, counter speech, one day I hope you realize how shameful this tweet is. I hope you realize it tomorrow. Um, and then another tweet, uh, your hatred made it onto Sky News, so this is another example of the relationship between online communication and traditional uh, mainstream media, just as in Kenya, um, sometimes hateful and inflammatory speech online gets um, gets reported on by the mainstream media, that happened in this case as well. Um, someone else uh, using a different, a different form of counter speech that says ignorant slash illiterate slash racist slash idiot. Um, even this this uh, preliminary data has suggested a new idea, you know, in the same way that we've been trying to classify different kinds of inflammatory speech, for example, dangerous speech, and trying to, dis to describe that uh, by, its, by its characteristics, rhetorical and otherwise, to find patterns within it um, and to distinguish it from the larger universe of hate speech. So could we also study counter speech, which is not homogenous, and develop a sort of field guide to that, a taxonomy of that? What forms of counter speech are out there and what kinds succeed in which ways and in what context. That could be quite useful, particularly for those of us who are interested in finding ways to diminish hatred that are not a censorship or punishment. A question back there? With regard to counter speech, have you considered effective ways to architect uh, services or platforms to facilitate counter speech, assuming for the moment that it's a good thing that we can identify the object of effective counter speech? Funny you ask, yes. Um, but I, I think I, I want to leave enough time uh, for Derek to talk, and also he knows more about that than I do. So um, can you hold the question for a moment, and I'll, I'll just get through the rest of these. Uh, yes, sorry. I was just wondering, did you break this down by device and ease it? You know, because I think sometimes we can dash off a, a Sorry, we can dash off hate speech a little easier. If you, if you see an article you disagree with, you just write it on whatever is easy, but if you have to log in and put in your password and come up with some sort of pseudonym, then you might be more reluctant to do so. Not yet, that's a fantastic idea. The question was, did you break it down by device? So there are all kinds of, of um, factors we could study to try to understand better when and how and why inflammatory speech happens and when and why different forms of counter speech happen and, and, and when and why they're success, successful. So just because um, we're getting to the fun part, um, here's someone else, counter speech, don't just hate her for her skin color, she's an American like anybody else. Counter speaker's grammar is good. Sorry, I just can't resist. Okay. Um, the response by the original tweet, first, I didn't realize it would explode like that. And then, can we scroll down a bit more? <coughs> I think it's funny what they have, uh, back up. I think it's funny what they have to say, but I am not racist. And then a little bit later, not very much later, by the way, finally, he says, he's tweeting, at Miss America, sorry for being rude and racist and calling you a Arab, Arab, sorry. Please tweet back so everyone will know it's real. Um, I'm very curious to know what your response is. We were surprised just to see that this sort of thing um, happens. Uh, curious, of course, to know whether this considerable shift, at least in what this guy is tweeting, if not also what he's thinking, um, whether this, how much of this shift is um, in response to this engagement online? Or is it that his grandmother sat him down in the kitchen and yelled at him, or what? It would be very interesting to find out. Then a few more examples. This is from France. We wanted to look at some different um, 
environments, of course, different climates. So this first tweet says, um, in religion, uh, homosexuality is forbidden, all gays will end up in hell. And then someone else uh, responds, um, um, they're not trying to, to, do, to do you any harm. Um, uh, why don't you love your, um, uh, you know, the other person? I can't think of the English. Right. Your neighbor, thank you. Um, it's in the Bible. Look, it's not your problem. It seems to me that, um, that your religion, no matter which one it is, doesn't actually preach hatred. Um, and then someone else, uh, homophobia is hatred. It's a form of racism. So, as you can see just from looking at these uh, few examples, already we can see that there are various different forms of counter-speech, including in the Miss America example, there's the correction of falsehood. Often in, in the uh, data we find that hatred and ignorance are, are combined. So one form of counter-speech in response to Dallas, the, the guy tweeting uh, about Miss America, is to say, Nina Dabalori is not Arab. But in another sense, that isn't counter-speech. Someone else said, and if she is Arab, that's just fine. She, if she were, in other words, she has every right to be Miss America, same as anybody else, actually, I guess not him, because he's a guy. Um, so could I just ask, uh, that's it for these. Shall we hold off on questions, if you don't mind, until um, Derek gets a chance to speak? Or did you? The question is uh, for actually very related to this specific topic. Um, I was the uh, first Yemeni to be in this universe, and uh, I got that. I can relate to that. That used, used to be me. Um, I'm sorry. That, but you do what you have to do. If you're a woman, you're always attacked. So that's just how. I mean, it's, it wasn't my choice to be a woman, but that made me a bigger fighter. So. The uh, big problem I have, and I'm still struggling with right now, is uh, with Human Rights Monitor, one of the people who helped collect human rights violations, actually two of them, one was gay, and the other was transgender. And among Human Rights Monitors, I mean people have different backgrounds. And uh, so I did the whole countering. And uh, now I'm receiving death threats. I received them yesterday, I'm just tweeting them at RightsCon, I don't know what else what to do. Twitter and Facebook haven't removed, it's mainly Facebook, but uh, Twitter and Facebook haven't removed the comments. The couple threats are in, Eng in Arabic, most of the threats are in English. This is going, happening to me right now, I don't know what to do. That's all, thank you. We have one more question and then we'll move on to Derek, is that okay? international relations community, uh, there is some debate as to whether uh, giving people lots of voice could actually stimulate further unrest. So in, in some cases, as you've identified here, there are racist and, and very destabilizing, unhelpful comments, and other people like, you know, be quiet and you're making a mistake. In other places, their neighbors are also sufficiently upset that uh, they say, no, go ahead, please kill your neighbor, this is like an outrage. Mm -hmm. and, and in some cases, genocide has ensued. So, uh, I don't mean to be too much of a downer, but I think the discussion needs to at least acknowledge that, and maybe we can think of some ways to tailor these access-giving technologies such that they maybe embed some values in them or something. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. The, you know, uh, the, really the point of this workshop is to suggest that um, it's, that we ought to study this and conduct some experiments on it to see um, when and if 
first of all, counter speech and other non-censorship methods can, can be effective um, in order to make some data-driven, evidence-based decisions instead of just kind of shooting in the dark. Um, one one um, perhaps useful observation is that a big difference between speech online and traditional speech offline is that before the before online speech, most of the time when when um, when people spoke with other people they regarded as their own, for example, when a leader spoke to his own family, his own soldiers, his own parishioners, his own clan members. Um, I say usually a guy, you know, okay, his or her. Um, speaker and audience would understand the special language in which usually we speak to one another. In other words, that speech within a particular normative community. And speech like that, traditionally and offline, would take place in a context in which speaker and audience would know that they, the others, would not overhear. In many ways, what's happening online is uh, uh, not only people talk about the proliferation of hatred online. It may not be that there's any more hatred, but rather that the rest of us now overhear it because speech crosses the boundaries between normative groups in a way in which it never did before. In other words, now we are all privy to much more of the internal speech of other communities. The fact that we're now privy can cause pain when women see rape jokes, for example, that they might simply not have overheard in the past. Um, it also can, um, uh, can increase the risk of violence, just as you said. And then third, it seems that in some cases, the exposure of a speaker to a, to a broader and different normative context, what we call broadening the audience, can also um, hold that speaker to account so that, so that he or she changes um, his or her speech in a, in a useful way. It would be very helpful to understand better, again, when and how. So with that, let me ask Derek to speak. Thank you. Um, so, uh, well, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm a professor of computer science at McGill University. And um, I'm a little disturbed that I'm the only person who doesn't have a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of embarrassing. But uh, as a computer scientist, uh, I will attempt to make up for it with content. Um, so uh, as, uh, as uh, soon as it's alluded to, we have uh, recently begun a, a project. Um, and I wanted to, really, I wanted to use this as an opportunity. I think we wanted to use this as an opportunity to sort of bring it to you. Um, and to offer the ways that we're thinking about approaching the problem and to see if there are particular uh, questions or ways of thinking about it that we should be considering as we move forward. Uh, to give a little bit of background, my work uh, in the past and, and continuing has focused largely on measuring and modeling large-scale human behavior in online environments. So um, we've, done, we're, we've worked on everything from uh, demographic inference, uh, you know, looking at inferring uh, features, sort of population statistics um, to um, uh, disaster response and situational awareness discovery um, in, uh, in disaster scenarios, but all within the online context. And so to me, um, the, you know, the topic of um, violent speech of, uh, and of counter speech is, is part of this uh, initiative, this broader idea that we need to be understanding the way that people are using these platforms. Um, and understanding is, is sort of a necessary step in terms of, uh, to, to return to an earlier question, how we build platforms or how we architect platforms and change them in order to actually create more um, harmonious, uh, constructive social, social environments. Um, and so the, the goal of the project that, that uh, we've, we've currently begun, which is, uh, which is uh, we're just receiving funding now for it, uh, wonderfully enough, um, focuses on understanding at large scale um, the, the phenomenon of violent speech and counter speech. Um, and so we've seen a number of examples already where we've looked at violent speech in its various forms, um, and we also have some anecdotal evidence that counter speech does actually happen uh, within these contexts. And so in our project, we framed a number of, of key questions. Um, 
So the, 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 the primary objective of this, of course, is motivated by a humanitarian goal of understanding uh, and, and, uh, and finding a way for communities to actually uh, handle violent speech. Um, but it's worth mentioning as well that these are, when we, when we deal with online expressions, um, we're dealing with platforms, with uh, Facebook, with Twitter, with you know, whatever's going to come next. Um, and uh, I think that it's worth mentioning up front that, uh, particularly in some preliminary discussions we've had with these organizations, it's clear that they have vested interest in actually solving these problems as well. Um, and I would like to just bring that to the fore because I think that there's, that often there's the perception that there are sort of these, uh, they're sort of agnostic to, to what's being done or that there isn't any incentive for them to actually participate in solving the problem. Um, but it's become clear that there are at least several reasons why platforms would themselves be interested in addressing the, the issue of violent speech and counter speech. Um, and so, you know, there's, first off, there's the genuine interest that uh, people in these organizations are interested in making sure that their platforms aren't being used for terrible things. Um, there's, um, there's also practical questions, though. So they, they do deal with reported content, and they're, getting, they're drowning in it. And so if they can find ways of actually decreasing the amount of reported content and allowing communities to actually solve this, that actually solves a very tractable problem for them. Um, the, uh, from a business perspective, the alienation of, uh, of users drive, can drive them away from a platform, uh, which can actually make it highly undesirable for there to be the kind of speech going on that would actually make people not want to use Twitter or Facebook or these different platforms. Um, and then finally, they really don't want to be in the business of resolving conflict. They want to build these social spaces to allow people to communicate and to, 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 uh, to share content and to engage with one another, build relationships. And that's always going to necessitate some level of, of, uh, of, of conflict resolution. But to the extent possible, they really don't want to be in that game. And so if we can provide mechanisms by which they can avoid this, they're only too happy to find a way to, to actually help solve the problem. So it's, it's, it's actually been very rewarding, even in the short term that we've been involved in this project, um, well, I've been involved in this project, involved in this for some time, to actually see the kind of um, receptiveness that's coming from the platforms and the kind of incentives that they're actually responding to. So I thought that that would be useful to, to share. Um, now, returning to the project itself, I just wanted to, to highlight a number of the key uh, challenges and, and key questions that we're asking, um, and then highlight sort of discussion points uh, where I think some feedback would be, would be really, really helpful. Um, so the first step in, in understanding counter speech is, uh, is frankly finding the counter speech um, and analyzing the counter speech. And so you, we can imagine the first problem being understanding counter speech as it occurs in the online platform. So that means we need to find ways of understanding uh, what uh, you know, how to measure the impact of counter speech. So we can find instances where this happens, but as Susan alluded to, understanding whether counter speech is successful when only when the originator of the speech recants. Is that successful counter speech? Or is successful counter speech when you actually have the counter speech itself sufficiently broadcasted that it reaches a wider audience than the original speech, than the original act itself? Um, and so, <coughs> I'd be interested uh, in your thoughts on you know, what actually makes for successful counter speech. Um, there's the question of, or there's the interesting phenomenon of counter speech and then the, the follow on support of counter speech. And how do we think about that? So if you have counter speech that, that's actually directed at the original actor, there can also be follow on discussion and comments that actually support the counter speech position. And so how do we think about, uh, how do we find that, how do we identify it, how do we define it, and how do we think about it as participating in this broader, um, in this broader debate? Um, there's certainly the case that there are inflection points uh, where we see uh, a rise in, uh, in violent speech or dangerous speech, and then a rise in, um, in counter speech. And, it, and it's interesting and, and productive to think about what actually drives those inflection points. Um, and where those responses actually happen, how they propagate. Is it, is it central hubs? Is it very well-connected people that are simply making single, single statements that reach a wide audience? Or is it actually diffusion through a social network? Those are two very different mechanisms um, that could both explain the kind of exposure that audiences have to these different, uh, 
these are the commentaries. Um, there's also the question of what kind of people are engaging in this. So, and, you know, very little work has actually gone into looking at large-scale phenomena of violent speech and counter speech. And so, we're really interested in thinking about how different, what, what kind of people are engaging in violent speech, and what kind of people are engaging in counter speech. Are there particular, um, do, do people have fairly characteristic histories that make it likely that in a particular context they will generate that kind of counter speech, or that kind of violent speech? Um, and can we anticipate that? Um, the, so moving on from simply understanding counter speech, so simply finding these case studies, there's also the question of this typology that Susan, that Susan alluded to. So once we actually have many different um, instances of counter speech itself, um, what would be very powerful is to be able to assemble an understanding of the different types of counter speech that we see, the different strategies that are used. And we, there has certainly been significant discussion about this in the past, but in the online environment, there's a particular opportunity to produce a typology that would be very productive and useful for even uh, plat the, the maintainers of platforms to understand how to recognize this, different mechanisms that may be more or less successful in the online environment. Um, the idea of recognizing a typology so really starts moving in the direction of sort of what my comfort zone is, which is really automating this. And so if we can really think about the different types of counter speech that exist, as well as the different, different types, of, types of violent speech that exist, we can start thinking about the extent to which we can actually automate the discovery of these different kinds of, of uh, basically, of, of discourses. And, um, and that, when we start thinking about truly large scale um, analysis of this kind of phenomenon, understanding it um, at the scale in which it's really happening, allowing platforms to really think about what's actually happening on their platform, we need some kind of automated system that's going to allow us to discover this scale, or at least allow us to get part of the way. Maybe we'll always need human uh, annotators at some point, but if we can even get them 50% of the way, that's going to be a huge step towards removing the bottleneck that, that they currently deal with. Um, and so there's the question of automation. Uh, and then finally, uh, and this returns to the, to the earlier point that was that was raised, is um, designing interventions. Um, and this is this is I've now stepped beyond what uh, the scope of our particular project is, our two-year project is. We're focused on collecting uh, case studies um, and operationalizing those case studies for actually building machinery for understanding the types and for classifying these. Um, but we can also imagine using these kinds of insights to design interventions. Um, and these interventions could look both as like platform modifications. What are the mechanisms that are actually built into a platform? Liking, unliking, favoriting, retweeting. All of these are mechanisms that can either support or, uh, or hinder uh, successful counter speech. Um, there's also uh, simply the educational dimension. So if every time somebody created a Twitter account, if they had to go through some process of actually learning about the, the different mechanisms for, um, for handling uh, aggressive or violent speech that they encounter online, would that actually improve the way that, uh, that, that this kind of speech is handled? And of course, that may be entirely too didactic, right? But there may be other mechanisms by which we can simply educate communities rather than um, really tweak the machinery of the platform itself. Um, so those are simply some ideas um, and the, sort of the direction in general that we're headed with this project. Um, as Susan alluded to, um, we have some case studies that we've, we've already found um, that we'll be building on. Uh, but at this point, I think it's fair to say we should open it up and, and get feedback. Yeah, you're, you've had your hand up for a while. Just a, I had a question for everyone. Um, when you're looking at the when you're looking at the speech online, hi uh, Dimitri. When you're looking at the speech online. How do you, if at all possible, engage in quality control or statistical simple random sampling? In other words, how can you really tell on the internet, particularly if someone's using Tor, let's say, who is who, who's really in Kenya? You know, there was a report from Glenn Greenwald in The Intercept last week that the NSA and GCHQ are very much involved in, to quote him, controlling, infiltrating, manipulating, and warping online discourse. So how do you, you know, can you filter that out? Can you filter out the NSA trolls online? Or, you know, how do you, so that's a question I have, you know, that's a real question, I guess. So. I don't know. Um, so nobody's really looked at a large corpus of online violent speech. 
or at least I'm not familiar with any corp corpora that, that well, yes, I mean, you've been working on it, right? But I mean, this, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is, this is uh, ongoing work, right? So we, you know, and actually we're going to be working together, but um, the, you know, it, these things are being actively collected, right? So this is a phenomenon we have to actually try to understand. Um, so what I would say is that, you know, the, the purpose of these projects, the purpose of what we've been talking about, is to actually turn up case studies mm -hmm. that are going to hopefully yeah, give us some understanding of that. And so yeah, we've gotten a number of questions as we've talked to various various uh, people at, at, at these various platforms as well as other potential collaborators as to, you know, well, what do you think of, how can you recognize this? How can you detect that? I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, because we'll have to see what it looks like at scale. And particularly when you talk about counter speech, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know exactly what to expect, but I think that particularly if we can develop a large enough uh, set that's actually diverse enough Mm -hmm. I think that we could actually learn a great deal. And so, and one question I would open up to the audience, to you, is where would we go to get a diverse sample? So we have, we now have a Kenyan case study where we have a, a substantive collection of various uh, violent speech acts. What other countries would act as some sort of random, random sample? I mean, presumably we have to leave Africa, right? So we look at, at Kenya, but, but what, what other countries would be productive places to actually look or cultures or conflicts or the, uh, yeah, the, just a difficult question I think I mean I think but I think we do have to think about it otherwise you run the risk you know in statistics if you if, you know it's all based on that simple random sample if you're not working with a simple random sample any extrapolation you make from that is nonsense you know and, and mathematicians you know, presume, you know you know you know that and so I think on the internet that challenge just becomes magnified I mean I was looking as you were talking I was looking at the World Bank numbers on uh, Kenyan internet a a accessibility, and it's about 30%. So in other words, the majority, right, roughly? Years left. That was 2012 for the World Bank. Maybe it's up a that little. Okay, 60. But point being, there's still a chunk of Kenyans who are not online. So already, just by looking online, you're already omitting X percentage of the population. And then you have the NSA trolls, and then you have, I feel like half the people I interact with on Twitter are like bots anyway. It's so hard to determine who's a real person and who's not. Interrupt because we're almost out of time and there are three questions. Can I just get to the three questions and then have you guys answer and then finish? Okay. Let's answer. That's the question then I'll get the next one. Ben Miller from Georgia State. I've uh, got a project we're trying to get funding for and starting off on toxic speech. So I want to kind of blend the toxic speech and dangerous speech conversations. So the, the slice that you're looking at is purely going to be textual. So toxic speech or dangerous speech, which manifests itself via through video or through images or through audio, is it can be captured in the project that you're starting? Correct? Not correct? They're just looking at Twitter. These, are, these could be captured. We're primarily looking at Twitter right so now. So it's only almost going to be purely text, okay. but at least so, in this stage. One second. So then to follow up on that, it sounds like the types of approach that you're going to apply are both a, a traffic modeling approach and then possibly a discourse analysis. Are there linguists working on the project with you who are going to be doing the, not the computational linguistics piece, but more of the discourse analysis of the sociolinguistic element? Once. Yes, once we have enough cases to start developing text on, we'll be able to help. Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, I totally agree sort of on the counter speech approach, etc. but one of the things that I wanted to ask about is, you know, in this session there have been so many adjectives used to describe speech, ranging from dangerous to inflammatory to offensive to toxic to violent. And I think part of the thing, like people like me who are really interested in the free speech question, uh, are I'm feeling a little uncomfortable because it seems to me on the one hand that speech is being over-categorized and two, that it's not very clear what, even though these are all subjective, there has to be some distinction between them, right, methodologically and conceptually. And it seems like they're being used sort of um, interchangeably. Yeah, interchangeably in overlapping ways. So that was my question, what is the real distinction between some of these categories? For instance, some of the examples that you showed to my sort of jaundiced eyes don't appear dangerous, they just appear offensive. Somebody else might think they're dangerous, right? This is the eternal free speech question. And yeah. the second okay. follow up to that very briefly, is, is it like if someone says something once or makes one comment, 
Does that necessarily mean that that's dangerous? Does frequency have anything okay, to do with it? Okay, may I answer it just because yeah. time is short? So, <coughs> I rapidly tried to describe the analytical framework the, which was turned into a coding sheet by Mati to examine each so-called, we use active speech, borrowing the term from philosophers of language and speech act theory, to analyze each act of speech in the context in which it was made or disseminated and classify it, as Angela said, into one of three categories. Offensive, moderately dangerous, and very dangerous. And so the line between what we call dangerous speech and, and not speech which is not dangerous is between the bucket offensive and moderately dangerous. We have one more question, question and we're over time. To toxic was used by someone else. I'm not sure how that's being defined. Inflammatory speech is just a colloquial term, not a term of art and not a legal term. And hate speech, as I said, we avoid because that's a big important category. I hope that's helpful. Actually, we're out of time and I feel bad, but can we have one more question? Is that all right with everybody? All right, you're taking your heads, yes. Well, thank you. So it's a, it's a very interesting topic. Um, now, I have been monitoring uh, the events in Ukraine for the past two and a half weeks, and before this, for one year, I've been monitoring uh, Putin's efforts to centralize propaganda and hate speech dissemination, whether in case of his help to Syrian Electronic Army, or most recently, with the events around Crimea. Have you looked at the structures where the hate speech is centralized and controlled, and how they're different from the kind of self-emerging hate speech centers that you've uh, covered so extensively? It's a wonderful question, which also implies, or uh, to me suggests the question, the distinction between hate speech and or dangerous speech produced by a state, or under the auspices of a state, which is often the case in a pre-genocidal situation, and hate speech and or dangerous speech produced, by, produced, produced outside the color of law or outside um, the authority of a state. But the short answer is, um, we haven't done any systematic analysis of the case, in the case of Ukraine, in part for lack of language capacity in that case. Um, so um, I think we'll be here even though we're out of time and would very much like to continue the conversation with all of you who are willing. Um, my email address is susan.benish at gmail.com in case you have, don't have time today. And there's this um, website, voicesthatpoison.org. Thank you so much. Thank you.